on Wednesday, people, getting you over the hump of what on what is the number one form, how to show on the streets, talking your Crimson Tide football, in my own words, Touchdown Alabama Magazine, with yours truly, the hype man, Stephen Smith, giving you that Alabama football fix. We're bringing the show to you from the magic city of Birmingham, streaming to you the show on YouTube. Speaking of the channel, Go ahead right now, give us a thumbs up, give us a like on the show, hit that subscribe button, turn all of those notifications on, hit that little bell, so that way you can have all the news, notes, information, entertainment, and conversation on your favorite program, that being the Crimson Tide. We also got you covered on Facebook and Twitter as well, all forms of social media, streaming to you the show, no excuse whatsoever for you not to be locked into. The number one ticket here for your crimson for your crimson tie. Gotta shout out my man John Ivory one time in the production studio doing his thing on today. Got a lot to get into, a couple of things to discuss and talk about. And uh, you know, first and foremost, you, you gotta look at you know the wide receiver room for Alabama. One Jamison Williams transfer from Ohio State. Can he continue the trend of having transfer wide receivers come in and help assist, build that chemistry with first year starting quarterbacks in Alabama in a quest to win a national championship? We'll talk Jamison Williams, also tight nation. You know, we do a uh, fine job here and trying to provide to you the the best in recruiting information for Alabama football. That's where Justin Smith comes in. We do the best in trying to get you the information on the uh, current Alabama players on the roster. But one thing we also do is we try to bring you the best in beat reporters on uh, nationally to talk about the Bama players in uh, the NFL because even though these players no longer at the with the Crimson Tide, your love for them, your appreciation for these players, it doesn't stop when they leave Alabama. You guys still want to know how these young men are doing, whether that is Mark Ingram or Julio Jones or Calvin Ridley or Jerry Judy or Tua Tonga Vailoa. You still want to know how these young men are progressing at the next level. So we're going to have two huge guests coming on to discuss Mac Jones for the Patriots and Calvin Ridley for the Atlanta Falcons. We got Alex Barth, who is a who is a, a, a reporter and a sports radio personality covering the Patriots for 98.5, the Sports Hub out of Boston. And we're gonna also have Tori McLaney, who covers the Atlanta Falcons, beat reporter for theathletic.com. So really excited to sit down with those two individuals to talk Mac Jones and Calvin Ridley. But also, I'm going to give my reaction to the overreaction part of uh, the NFL right now being minicamp with the Miami Dolphins. Tua Tungavangoa is concerned. So many people were jumping out the window on Tuesday because he had five interceptions in the month of June in a rainy minicamp practice. But he came back today and had six touchdown passes, no picks, and all you hear are crickets. Not so many articles being written about this. I will have my reaction on that as well. But we want to hear from you today, the Bama Nation, 205-448-1358. That's the number to call in to let your voice be heard on the show, 205-448-1358. And one more time, 205-448-1358. Got to shout out Jimmy Clay. Boom, bam, bang, Jimmy. Baddest donator in the game, Clay. That $25 donation helping us out already to start off the show in the Super Chats. That daily Super Chat go $25, $75, excuse me. Daily Super Chat go $75 there. But we jump into first topic of conversation on this evening, and it goes to one Jamison Williams, the wide receiver transfer from Ohio State. There have been some rumbling so far coming out of the Alabama summer program uh, on campus where seven on sevens and 11 on 11 drills are concerned. Williams is already impressing teammates, already impressing guys on campus with his skill set, with his route running, with his speed, uh, with his athleticism, with his agility, just his entire playmaking capabilities. Uh, players are already starting to warm up to what he can do on this field for this team. Uh, just different players, whether it's in the wide receiver room, whether it's in 
the running back room, the tight end room, like all of the players are just right now drawn to what this young man does as far as his speed, as far as his technique, his route running, and what he can bring to this young but talented wide receiver room. Williams already making plays there uh, so far throughout the summer in seven on seven and 11 on 11 drills. Now, one of the biggest plays he had at Ohio State was he had the huge touchdown, if you remember, in the college football playoff semifinal against Clemson at the 45-yard catch there, helping the other Buckeyes get the 49-28 the win over the Tigers in you know, Louisiana Sugar Bowl matchup. Uh, Williams in that game, three catches for 62 yards, but had a huge performance, huge catch there in that matchup against the Tigers. When you look at just his numbers as far as his career is concerned for the Buckeyes, I mean, Williams, no, 6'2", 189 pounds. He's known more so as a speedster. Can get up and snatch the ball in the air if you need him to, but he's known more so as a speedster. He's from St. Louis, Missouri, a guy that was a four-star recruit, four-star prospect when he played for the Buckeyes, a guy that played in 22 career games at Ohio State. So a lot of experience coming from a major program, a power five school, a big brand, big, a big brand, big name school, such as Ohio State in the Big Ten. When you talk about his career of a young man, 15 receptions for 266 yards, three touchdowns. This past season had nine catches for 154 yards and two scores. So just there, the background information on one Jamison Williams. Now, when you discuss Alabama, Nick Saban and the program, they've had recent success when you discuss transfers at wide receiver that come into the program and they help the first year starting quarterback be calm, be cool, be connected, get their sea legs under them. They built the chemistry with that particular quarterback and help that quarterback guide the team to winning a national championship, winning an SEC championship, or a got that quarterback to success, getting it to the college football playoff. If you go back to 2015, this was Jacob Coker and Richard Mullaney. Bama brought in Mullaney, a.k.a. Slotty Pippen, in the summer of 2015 from Oregon State. And when you put Mullaney with Coker, you know, Mullaney caught 38 passes that year in 2015, I believe for 549 receiving yards, if I'm not mistaken. Had like four to five touchdowns in there, just really played well. He settled Coker in. He had Coker's back. He and Coker bounced off well off each other. They played well together, and the two ended up no national championship 2015 conference title as well. When you talk about 2016, the very next year, this is where you had a first-year starting quarterback and a freshman in Jalen Hurts. Alabama brought in a graduate transfer and Garrick Dieter from Bowling Green uh, to come in here. And, uh, you know, that dynamic right there, you know, Hurts with, with, with Dieter. Dieter making sure that, you know, he's got Hurts. Hurts has got him. You know, Dieter, 15 catches that season for 214 yards, had five touchdowns. Now, he could have had more. He could have done more. He could have been targeted more. But the gist of the conversation is, you know, Mullaney helped Coker have success. Dieter helped uh, Jalen Hurts have success. So when you bring this down here to uh, the likes of Bryce Young and Jamison Williams, here's the big question right here. Can Williams continue that, that trend, right, of he's the transfer receiver, he's the guy that's got experience, but, and now he's in here with the Bryce Young, who's young, who's talented, who's fiery, who's competitive, who's got that Kelly swag, but his first year as a starting quarterback for the Crimson Tide, you know, these two being able to have that chemistry, have that camaraderie, being able to work together on routes, being able to work together on concepts, you know, being able to understand, you know, if Jamison Williams is breaking off this route right here, Bryce Young is having him that football. Jamison Williams breaking off the route over here, Bryce Young is having him that football. They go into the huddle, understanding what each one likes to do, what each one's tendency is, when they're in the meeting rooms, when they're in the field, rooms when they're out there on the practice field they understand what each one loves to do how each one loves to operate how each one loves to loves to jump and go so at this time in the summer this is where you get that that work in that tutelage in that that, that camaraderie in that practice in between Jamison Williams and one 
Bryce Young. And, and this and this could be really fun here. This could be real. This could be really, really fun here because you would have a receiver that you could get Bryce all the more comfortable with. You could have a receiver that you know can be a guy that if a Mechie's not there, if a Bolden's not there, you can. He, he can hit Jamison Williams. You know, Williams can take that ball, go over the house, create touchdowns, create big plays, create, you know, you know, huge chunk yard situations for the Alabama offense. But right now, as he is in the summer workouts, Jamison Williams is impressing the teammates. He's impressing the guys on the field. You know, everybody is all in, bought in on what he's going to be able to do out there, you know, on the field. He's excelling in seven on seven. He's excelling in 11 on 11 catching passes, getting the oohs and the ahs, big time speed, big time acceleration, big time route, route runner. So very awesome to have this young man here. And it's going to be cool to see, you know, what he does in the fall here for your Crimson Tide. But people, that's going to actually lead us into our first break on the show. Don't touch that dial. We're just getting started. Upon our return, we take we go to the phone lines to take your calls, to engage you, to get your phone calls, your thoughts, your tweets, your conversations. We get a dialogue with you after this. You're watching In My Own Words with Stephen M. Smith, brought to you by We Own the Fourth Quarter. Get your four-finger bling necklace today by visiting weownthefourthquarter.com. Throw them foes up. Every sports fan deserves the proper representation. Wit Will Sports introduces to you the title towel. Wave that title towel in the air like you just don't care. In support of Nick Saban and the Alabama Crimson Tide. Only $9.99 and it lasts a lifetime. Head on over to WitWillSports.com and get your title towel today. Remember the taste of Grandma's delicious sweets? Emily's Heirloom Pound Cakes brings back those precious memories with just one bite. Each cake made from scratch. They make the perfect dessert to share with family and friends for any occasion, and ordering is easy. Visit Emily's Heirloom Pound Cakes.com. Click the online store and shop. Then pick up your fresh cake at the kitchen in downtown Homewood. Order yours online at Emily's Heirloom Pound Cakes.com. Emily's Heirloom Pound Cakes, making memories from scratch. Thank you for tuning in. Show your support right now by clicking that like button. If you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button now and enable all notifications to make sure you don't ever miss any of the best Alabama football news, notes, and information right here on Touchdown Alabama. Folks, back in here from the break of the number one form for Crimson Tide football news. In my own words, yours truly, Stephen Smith of Touchdown Alabama Magazine on a Wednesday hump day. Hottest show in the streets right here. And before we go to the phone lines to take your calls, call statement brought to you by the Blue Wrench Gang. Gotta shout out Jimmy Clay again. Boom, bam, Jimmy the Bad Man, baddest donator. Put the money in the bag, Clay. And have a $25 donation coming from Jimmy Clay, but right behind him not to be outdone. McConnick comes in with his own $25 donation as that daily super chat goal of $75 has been met. Appreciating the support there coming from Jimmy Clay and McConnick and all of you as fans donating, supporting, helping us out here on the show. But like I mentioned, we're getting to the phone lines here to take your calls. Call segment brought to you by the Blue Wrench Gang, 205-448-1358. That is the number to call right there, 205-448-1358. And one more time, 205-448-1358. We start the evening off with my man, Wayland. Wayland, what's going on, brother? All right. <laughs> You done got me tickled this bunch here on TDA here. Jimmy and McCormick here, I'll tell you what, they're laying this money up. Oh, I'm going to have to get a bigger car or something. You reckon my Thunderbird to hold up? Reckon my Thunderbird to hold all this money they've been de delving out, uh, Stephen? Probably so. Probably so, Wagon. But, Wagon, you can do it, man. You can do it. Hey, we appreciate you regardless, Wagon. <laughs> I don't know these boys. These boys, I tell you what, I, I, I took the – we had a good service there today. Uh, you know, uh, Chris, for uh, good service over in Hoover. I drove the Thunderbird, uh, uh, the red Thunderbird with the Bama, <laughs> with my Bama tag on front there. I thought that was appropriate. James Fan said a lot of good words. And uh, believe it or not, my granddad had 100 acres up here where we used to live. And uh, 
I still own most of it. And James Fan's wife's uh, live right next door to me all my life there. So I've known her all my life. James is a good man, uh, a good weatherman, a good person. You won't beat him. His wife's a good lady. Her mother, Miss Old Mary, was a good woman. So I just wanted to call in. And, you know, I was a little shook there, money, but uh, – we had a good service there for Chris, and he's in a better place. But i tell you what, I do appreciate all this stuff here on TDA, all y'all putting this money out. See these town, countries, and states. I love it. TDA loves it. Stephen loves it. Y'all looking good. I don't want to hold everybody up. Stephen, I don't know if you want to throw something in about Alabama football. Is everything okay down there? Everything's good down here. That The guys are in 7-on-7, seven 11-on-11 seven, 11 on 11, uh, camps right now or drills right now. I'm just waiting for the first day of fall camp. Once August gets in, I'm ready to go. Yeah, exactly right. I'm ready to. So I'm going to leave out with this. <clears throat> Y'all, I don't know, Stephen, you may have to get a Brinks truck for all that money down there. If you do, just call me. I'll help you get it there. We'll write a check. We have lost a revered colleague whose indelible imprint will serve as a hallmark of decency, honesty, and journalist integrity. May his memory be a blessing to all. That was for Chris. All right, everybody stay safe. I don't know if I'll be back Friday or not. Maybe i got a few things to do. It may be a couple of weeks. Y'all stay safe. We'll see everybody again. Bye-bye, Stephen. Appreciate that call, and they're coming from Wayland, and absolutely uh, best, you know, outstanding service. I pay homage there to one Christopher Sign. You know, may he rest in peace, that tragic loss that took place on last week. But we take our next call right here. You're live on the show. What's going on? Hey, Stephen. How are you doing? This afternoon. Doing good, man. How you doing, man? How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, I got a couple of questions for you. Uh, my first question is, uh, what do you think are the chances of Alabama landing uh, Justice Finkley? Justice Finkley. Justice Finkley. I like it. I like it a lot. I know in talking with Justin Smith, our scouting and recruiting leader for TDA, uh, has a great relationship with Justice. He feels like Alabama is in a good spot for him. I will continue to contact, we'll be in contact with Justin about that. But uh, according to Justin, Alabama right now in a good spot for Justice right now. And my second question is, if you were to project the starting wide receiver uh, lineup, how would you do it? Good question. So I would go Mechie, Bolden, uh, Jamison Williams, and number four. Number four, the number four would be a toss up between Asia Hall and JoJo Earl. But we appreciate that call right there. It'd be the it'd be the Asia Hall or JoJo Earl for four because I, I want to see how JoJo Earl does. I want to see how he looks so far uh, in the summer in the summer drills. I know I'll be ch I'll be talking with my guys that are close inside the program to get some information there on Earl. But we've already seen what Asia Hall looks like thus far coming off the spring game. So between him and Earl, we the toss up there for the number four spot but as you guys continue to get your calls in here we got mechanic another 25 dollar donation in the super chats appreciate the love there as always from mechanic helping us out here on the show but we take a quick transition here to a quick topic and it goes to the Alabama defense where we pick up Josh Job Alabama senior cornerback Josh Job is one of 42 preseason candidates for the lot Impact Trophy uh, watching list, the Not Impact Trophy. Impact being an acronym for integrity, maturity, uh, performance, academics, community, and tenacity. Just, uh, just the award for the individual, the student athlete that does outstanding work on the field, outstanding performance in the field of play, in the classroom, in the community. That's just what you know the Not Impact Trophy represents. It's named after a tremendous college football player in one Ronnie Lott. So Josh Job, who last season had 55 tackles, had 11 pass breakups, uh, had two and a half sacks, two tackles for loss, put some really good stats together. Now for me, got to continue to play physical, but not get so handsy to where penalties ensue, but still had a good year. Still had a good, productive, solid year this past season. But Job, one of the 42 preseason candidates for 
the Lock Impact Trophy watch list. But we got Jimmy Clay again. <laughs> Jimmy Clay and Mechanic are going at it. But who can drop the most money in? Another $25 donation from the man, Jimmy Cash Clay. Appreciating the love from Jimmy Clay, Mechanic, and all of you guys helping us out here on the show. We take a break right now, but upon our return, we get to our two all-star guests, Alex Barth and Tori McLaney, to talk about Mac Jones, Calvin Ridley, and the many camps they're involved in with the Patriots and the Atlanta Falcons right after this. You know what we do at the start of the fourth quarter. We throw them foes up. But now, you don't have to wait until the fourth quarter. Get your four-finger bling necklace at weownthefourthquarter.com. It's the first and only logo that captures the essence of all Crimson Tide players and fans as we represent the legendary Alabama football fourth quarter dominance. Get your four-finger bling necklace right now at weownthefourthquarter.com. Get yours today and stun on them haters. Touchdown Alabama Magazine is Alabama football's premier publication. A subscription to Touchdown Alabama Magazine is the perfect gift for any Alabama fan. For exclusive news and information, recruiting updates, a free annual print magazine, and more, go to touchdownalabama.com and click join. Only $7.95 per month or pay $74.95 for a full year subscription. That's a yearly saving of $20. Go to touchdownalabama.com today and roll tide. I gotta say this right now. You, the Bama Nation, you guys are incredible. You guys are incredible. Give yourselves a hand. We got Waylon in here, y'all. Waylon with that 999 in the super chest. Is that Mechanic again? Can we please put the horn on Mechanic and Jimmy Clay one time? Another $25 coming in here from Mechanic. You guys are beating down the door of a daily super chat. Go appreciate every last one of you guys helping us out here on the show. But as we're back here from the break, we're going to go to the In My Own Words hotline. We got the two superstar guests in the building. Told you we got superstars when it comes to talking Bama in the NFL. And the first of the two... We got Alex Barth, who is a reporter, sports radio personality for 98.5 Sports Hub out of Boston, Massachusetts, to talk to those Patriots and Mac Jizzle, Mac Jones. Alex, so happy to have you in here, buddy. How you doing? I'm good, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Alex, let's get down to business right here. So, Bill Belichick, the Patriots, go drafted Mac Jones back in – April number 15 overall in the first round and had a great rookie minicamp. But so far right now in mandatory minicamp, he's starting to get that workload increased a little bit. He's starting to show some signs of why, you know, Belichick went with him, him Jones being a bit of a perfectionist. You've got receivers talking about him. You've got offensive lineman Trent Brown talking about him. Like, when you look at Mac Jones, what really has Patriot Nation players – coaching staff what has the Patriots so excited right now of what Mac Jones can do and what he is doing in minicamp so I think what's really exciting at least for me about Mac Jones isn't necessarily what he does it's what he doesn't do he doesn't make mistakes he's a very controlled uh, smart calculated player he's a guy who uh, you know can he can really use his, his mind to pick a defense apart as well as his arm and that's what this system in New England is predicated on. So having a quarterback who projects to be that kind of guy where, you know, maybe he's not the playmaker Cam is, but he's going to be able to, uh, you know, maybe pick up the offense pre-snap a little bit better, which Cam has said that, that he's struggled with. I, I think that's the excitement is that with all the talent they've brought in around him, Mac Jones is a guy who, who can just kind of manage things and make sure that, you know, it, it, there's not too many mistakes going on. Now, going back to what I mentioned here, Alex, about Mac Jones being a perfectionist in an imperfect world. He was out there today in, in, in minicamp, and he had an interception. He threw a pick, and he was pounding the ground. There were reports saying he almost pounded the ground. He was very frustrated with himself because he wants to make the right play so badly. When you look at Bill Belichick and, and Josh McDaniels, how much have you seen both of those two coaches kind of say, we love you, Mac, for doing that but don't get overly down on yourself 
Yeah, I, I, I think the coaches have preached that it's a process and that, you know, it's going to take time. And, yeah, that moment today it was certainly something to see. And I think, you know, if you've ever been to the driving range, right, that last ball, you want to make sure you hit that last ball at the driving range well because you got to, you know, drive home with that and sit with that. It was his last throw of minicamp. It was his last somewhat competitive throw for a month and a half until training camp starts. And, you know, now he's got to sit with that for that next month and a half. And like you said, for a guy who's a perfectionist, knowing that was his last throw, I think that's going to eat at him a little bit. If you're just tuning into the show, people, we got Alex Barth on the phone lines covering the New England Patriots, a reporter and uh, sports radio personality for 98.5, the sports hub out of Boston. Alex, so when you – when New England made the move to draft Mac, when they made the move to draft Mac, what were kind of the first few things going through your mind? Because people were saying, well, he's not a Trevor Lawrence. He's not a Justin Fields. He's not a, a Trey Lance. He's not none of these guys that could really, you know, move, move. But when you saw Mac Jones' name come on the ticker, drafted by New England, what were the first thoughts in your mind? I was excited. I really was because – you know, even if Cam Newton bounces back this year, he's 32 years old. He's on a one-year contract. This team really didn't have much of a future at the quarterback position, and now they do. And we'll see if, if Jones turns out to be that. But there is a long-term plan, and I think that that's so, so important in the NFL to always have a long-term plan at quarterback. And, you know, beyond Mac Jones, I don't know that there was one left on the board. I wasn't super high on – Kyle Trask. I wasn't super high on Kellen Vaughn, Davis Mills, guys like that. So, you know, I think they got a guy that gives them some hope for the future. And then, you know, the comparisons to Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence, those guys are great. But like I said before, I think Mac is a great fit for what they want to do. I think he's a guy who can come in and not have to change the way he operates. And they don't have to change a ton about the way they operate. And it's just kind of a smooth transition for both parties. Uh, if and when he he assumes his starting role. Last kind of quick one here on our end, uh, Alex, as we are talking with Alex Barth here on the line covering the New England Patriots. What's been the best part so far of the dynamic between uh, McDaniels and Jones as they're learning each other? Uh, I I think, you know, you just kind of see it's a conversation. You know, you see some players come in and they take coaching, and that's what it is. They get coached up and they implement it. It seems like Jones and McDaniels have a back and forth, and at that position, uh, you like to see that, especially from a rookie. It shows he's confident. It shows he knows what's going on, and he's not afraid to give his input. And by the way, with Cam Newton, too, and that's a former NFL MVP, uh, it doesn't seem like he's afraid to, to put his two cents in there as well. So, you know, that's not to say I, I think he's getting ahead of himself. He's been very humble about everything, but he doesn't seem afraid to, to make it a dialogue and not just a one-way street between him and the coaches. He's Alex Barth, ladies and gentlemen, covering the New England Patriots, reporter and sports radio personality for 98.5, the, the uh, sports hub there out of Boston, Massachusetts, talking to one Mac Jones with us on the show. Alex, man, appreciate you coming on to share that information with us on the show. Take care of yourself, man. Be good. Thanks for having me. we got a bunch of Alabama players up here, so anytime. Absolutely. Alex Barth there covering the New England Patriots for 98.5, the sports hub out of Boston, giving us some giving us some news, some updates on Mac Jones from mandatory minicamp. But we go from one side to the other side here, the southeast region, where we pick up Tory McLaney, who covers the Atlanta Falcons for the Athletic. Tory, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? Doing fantastic. We got Tori McLaney here on the phone lines covering the Atlanta Falcons for theathletic.com. So, Tori, we look at now. Calvin Ridley's the man now. Calvin Ridley is wide receiver number one in Atlanta. Uh, the, the reporters have been asking him questions about is he ready for this? Is he built for this? Is he prepared for this? What's kind of the vibe right now in the A-Town when you look at Julio's gone, but you have another former Alabama receiver that's ready to be Matt Ryan's number one guy. What's the vibe in Atlanta right now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very obvious that Calvin Ridley is is ready for this next step. It almost does feel like a natural progression for him. And this does seem 
like the next step in his career. I think we were able to see last year more than any other year that he's been in the league, what it would look like without Julio, because you know, they, the Falcons didn't have Julio for seven games and that's really tough. But when you have Calvin there and, and his production stays on pace, he, I mean, he had his first 1000 plus receiving yard season last year. I mean, he, he was doing really good things with Julio on the field and without Julio on the field. And really, for from a personal standpoint, if you're just looking at the individual aspect of Calvin Ridley's game, he got more opportunities when Julio's not on the field, and that just makes sense because, you know, you only have so many plays in a game. You only have so many opportunities to get the ball into your playmaker's hands, and when you have to split it between Julio and Calvin, th- that production for Calvin's going to gonna go down. But the fact that he's now the number one guy, and we saw him be the number one guy for seven games, last last season I think it, it just goes to show that he is ready for this now Tori with Julio gone him now with the Tennessee Titans do you see the Falcons offense changing any at all or do you feel like with Calvin uh, they can still run the same plays they can still run the same sets w- w- would there be just a ginormous change seeing Julio's exit I think it's less, honestly, and this is going to sound a a, a tad funny, I think it's less about Julio leaving and more about Dirk Cutter leaving. I think it's going to be very interesting to see the shifts and the changes that Arthur Smith implements as he's becoming the play caller for in Atlanta. And I think that more than Julio leaving is, is the questions that I have about what the Atlanta Falcons offense is going to look like in 2021. How is Arthur Smith going to take what he was doing at Tennessee, translate that to Atlanta and what Atlanta does really well? And now he has Matt Ryan. Now he has Calvin Ridley. Really trying to figure out and see, okay, what is this Atlanta offense going to look like under Arthur Smith? If you're just tuning into the show, ladies and gentlemen, in my own words on a Wednesday, we're joined by Tori McNaney, who covers the Atlanta Falcons for the – for the uh, athletic.com talking Calvin Ridley here in minicamp here for the Falcons. So, Tori, when, when you look at just, you, bring, you brought up Arthur Smith there, and he's going to want to create balance. He's going to want to create, you know, a good mixture here of run and pass. But even with him wanting to do that, could this still be a situation where Calvin Ridley could have a, a first team all pro type of year because his targets did go up when Julio didn't play last year? He, he did have a 1,300 yard season receiving in 2020. Could this be a year where he's entering year four? He's now even more comfortable with what Atlanta wants to do. Could this be a first team all pro year for Calvin? I think so. I have a lot of really lofty expectations for Calvin Ridley, and I think he does as well. I think if Calvin stays healthy, this is – this. I know we talk, we talk about Calvin all the time in the league because he is one of the elite receivers, but he was always – it was always Calvin and Julio. It was always a, a duo, and they always said Atlanta has one of the best receiving duos in the league, and that was very, very true. But now it, it shifts, and it's it, – not, I'm not going to say it's the Calvin Ridley show because I don't think that's necessarily it. I do think that Matt Ryan, Kyle Pitts, Mike Davis, I mean, it, Russell Gage, there are a lot of different guys that they are throwing out there in 2021. But I still think that Calvin Ridley is going to have a really, really good season. And that's the expectation that he has for himself now being the number one guy in, in this scenario in, with this team. I think it's going to be a really good year for Calvin. I do. Last quick one here, Tori, and, and, and this was for me. Julio could not get that Vince Lombardi trophy in Atlanta. Can Calvin get that Lombardi? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, we'll see. I, I think it's still really, really early in the Arthur Smith, Terry Fontenot era. We really don't know exactly what to expect out of Atlanta with – a whole new coaching staff coming in, almost an entire new front office coming in. We don't know what a potential rebuild would look like with this team. This is still very early in this overall transition. So for me to say that Calvin Ridley is going to go out and win the Lombardi, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable saying that just yet, but I know that there are a lot of people in Atlanta that really, really want to see the Arthur Smith, Terry Fontenot era in Atlanta succeed. So we'll see. 
She's, te- she's Tori McLean, ladies and gentlemen, covering the Atlanta Falcons for TheAtlantic.com, coming on here to talk about Calvin Whitley and his jump to now be the number one option at wide receiver for the Falcons this season. Tori, we appreciate you coming on to share the nuggets there on Whitley with us on the show. You stay safe, be good, take care of yourself. Awesome. You did the same. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Tori McLaney from the from theathletic.com talking Calvin Ridley at Nana Falcons minicamp right there. We're going to take a break here on the show. People don't touch that dial. When we get back, we'll return the phone lines to take your calls right after this. Don't touch that dial. Call in right now as we're taking your calls up next on In My Own Words with Stephen M. Smith. Brought to you by We Own the Fourth Quarter. Visit WeOwnTheFourthQuarter.com now to get your four-finger bling necklace. You know what we do at the start of the fourth quarter. We throw them foes up, but now you don't have to wait until the fourth quarter. Get your four-finger bling necklace at WeOwnTheFourthQuarter.com. It's the first and only logo that captures the essence of all Crimson Tide players and fans as we represent the legendary Alabama football fourth quarter dominance. Get your four-finger bling necklace right now at WeOwnTheFourthQuarter.com. Get yours today and stun on them haters. Touchdown Alabama Magazine is Alabama football's premier publication. A subscription to Touchdown Alabama Magazine is the perfect gift for any Alabama fan. For exclusive news and information, recruiting updates, a free annual print magazine, and more, go to touchdownalabama.com and click join. Only $7.95 per month or pay $74.95 for a full year subscription. That's a yearly saving of $20. Go to touchdownalabama.com today and roll tide. Thank you for tuning in. Show your support right now by clicking that like button. If you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button now and enable all notifications to make sure you don't ever miss any of the best Alabama football news, notes, and information right here on Touchdown Alabama. We are back in here, folks. Back in here from the break of the number one form for your Crimson Tide football news. In my own words, yours truly, Stephen Smith of Touchdown Alabama Magazine on a Wednesday. About to get back, get about to get back to jump into the phone line soon to take your calls. Call statement brought to you by the Blue Wrench Gang. But before that, got to shout out my man Randy. Yes, that five dollar donation, the super chats. Appreciate that love there from the man Randy Harris. But we're back into the phone line soon to. Take your calls. Call segment brought to you by the Blue Wrench Gang, 205-448-1358. That's the number to let your voice be heard on the show, 205-448-1358. And one more time, 205-448-1358. As you're getting your thoughts in here, got to transition to this topic. So Jerry Judy was featured on First Take uh, this week, and he spoke on what makes Alabama the elite premier program for wide receivers. Listen to what Jerry Judy said. What's in the water down in Alabama, by the way? You got you, Calvin Ridley, Julio Jones got this start, Nick Saban, you got Devontae Smith. Jerry, what is in the water down in Tuscaloosa where also you turn around and they're great receivers time and time again coming out of that school? Uh, you know, it's just a great program. You know, they develop players um, to become NFL NFL um, players. So, you know, Coach Saban do a great job over there just to organize and bring in great talent. Um, and when you're surrounded by great talent, ain't nothing but, but to become good. So just being able to be around those guys really motivates you to just be the best player you could be. That's former Alabama wide receiver and first-round pick from the 2020 NFL Draft to the Denver Broncos, Jerry Judy, featured there on First Take, talking about, you know, what makes Alabama the elite program? What is in the water in Tuscaloosa that makes the university a special program for wide receivers? And ever since Julio Jones said yes to Nick Saban in 2008, Alabama has placed seven guys in the first round of the NFL Draft with Julio, Amari Cooper, Calvin Ridley, Jerry Judy, uh, Henry Ruggs, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle, th- those seven guys. And John Mechie potentially can be next. Now, it all depends on, you know, Mechie this season, got to have a big year, got to have the consistent hands. You know, we, we know the speed's good, route running's good. He's, he's got explosive playmaking ability, but being able to consistently 
catch the football when it's placed on him, but definitely the talent is there when you look at Mechi, the opportunity to be a, a first-round pick, but just seven guys since 2008 when Julio got started that have all went first round here for the tie. And of the seven, you got to think of the seven, five of them were top ten picks? I mean, uh, so Julio was top ten. Julio was top ten. Uh, Amari was top ten. He went number four overall to the Raiders uh, in that 2015 draft. So Julio was top ten. Amari was top ten. Uh, uh, let's see here. Amari was top 10. Uh, Smitty was top 10. Uh, Waddle was top 10. So four, four of the seven uh, that were drafted were, were top 10. That's crazy. And Mechie is the next one in line here. So people are understanding. Players are understanding. Student athletes coming out of high school are understanding. If I'm playing at the wide receiver position and I want to go in the first round, I want to go in the top 10, I want to win in the Belitnikoff Award, I want to have a shot to win the Heisman, among other things, and I have to find my way to Alabama. Yes, there are other schools that try to claim wide receiver U. LSU tries to claim it. Other programs try to claim it. But when you look at Alabama, and the steady, consistent track record that Nick Saban has had, not just in recruiting, but in developing these players, cultivating these players, molding these players, and then shipping them off to the NFL draft where they are taken in the first round. You got to find yourself in Tuscaloosa where the Crimson Tide, you know, is concerned. But big ups there to Jerry Judy kind of explaining what's in the water here in Tuscaloosa in terms of why the Crimson Tide is wide receiver you. But we take a break right now on the show, folks. Don't touch that down because when we return, I will get into my reaction for, of Tua Tagovailoa. His performance from today's minicamp where the Dolphins are concerned and why people need to continue to be patient with this brother right here. We'll talk to her after this. If you're an avid Alabama Crimson Tide fan and you love to flaunt it, then show your Alabama Crimson Tide support by grabbing the Alabama sneakers. They feature bold Crimson Tide graphics, so no one will be able to question where your allegiance lies. When you add these sweet sneakers to your Alabama Crimson Tide collection, go to stsfootwear.com and use the code TDALABAMA for $15 off your purchase. That's code TDALABAMA for $15 off your purchase. Go to stsfootwear.com and get your Alabama sneakers today. Touchdown Alabama Magazine is Alabama football's premier publication. A subscription to Touchdown Alabama Magazine is the perfect gift for any Alabama fan. For exclusive news and information, recruiting updates, a free annual print magazine, and more, go to touchdownalabama.com and click join. Only $7.95 per month or pay $74.95 for a full year subscription. That's a yearly saving of $20. Go to touchdownalabama.com today and roll tide. Back in here, folks, from the break of the number one forum for Bama football news. In my own words, on a Wednesday hump day, yours truly, Stephen Smith of Touchdown Alabama Magazine. Appreciating all you, the fans out there, checking out the show, calling in, writing in, donating in, doing what you do. And making this your show, definitely definitely appreciate you guys. But before we jump into the final topic of conversation, got to remind you of TDAware.com. That is TDAware.com. So for all of you fans still overjoyed with the Crimson Tides National Championship, we want you to check out our Championship Connection merch. Now this means you grab you an eight of them thanks folk hoodie, t-shirt or sweatshirt as well as our got 18 we do shirts designs that feature all 18 championship years on the back you head on over to tdaware.com do it right now tdaware.com you go have a championship collections merch tab you get those shirts that gear today show them that support for coach saban university of alabama the student athletes and us here at touchdown alabama magazine but now we get into the conversation on one Tua Tongo Vangoa, second year quarterback for the Miami Dolphins, was drafted out of Alabama, 2020 venue number five overall. Tua entering his second year in the fall, but right now he's participating 
in mandatory minicamp. Friday will be the last day of minicamp, but mandatory minicamp today. He had a bounce back performance today. Six touchdowns. Six touchdown passes for Tua today. No interceptions. I mean, was throwing the ball, was being aggressive, was making plays. I was reading where he had a 50-yard hookup to to, 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 to to Waddle on the field. I was reading where he had another touchdown pass to Devontae Parker. He had another touchdown pass to, uh, I think, Jakeem Grant. If not Jakeem Grant, it was uh, it, it, one of the other receivers out there. But the point being, six touchdown passes, no picks for Tua. He was in complete command, complete control, complete in pocket, was doing his thing out there on the field for the program. And just going back to all the hard work that he's done throughout the offseason, as, as, as you look at this video on screen here, he's been getting he's been getting in hard work. He's been pushing himself, he's been challenging himself, he's been working through the hip, he's been working through the hip. You know, he's almost two years removed now from the hip injury. So you're seeing the movement, you are seeing the, the, the fluidity, the flexibility of the hip, of the legs, the, the, the agility to, to drive the ball, to drive his hips, to drive the get the ball up and down the field for this particular team in this upcoming season. But what's crazy here is one of the comments coming from, you know, whether it was the Dolphin fans or different media out there going back to, you know, a rough performance by Tua on Monday, well, on, on Tuesday, somebody said, well he, well, he, well, he was overrated in Alabama. In Alabama, you know, Tua had the best wide receivers, the best running backs, the best uh, offensive line, the best coach, the best offensive coordinator. Tua was not overrated in Alabama. Tua was not overrated where the Crimson Tide are concerned because at the end of the day, he still had to target those wide receivers. He still had to target those running backs. He still had to target those tight ends. He still had to take what Nick Saban and the different coordinators he had that were molding him, that were crafting him, that, that were teaching him, he still had to take those things and apply it onto the field. So Tua was never overrated at Alabama. Yes, he had some injury issues, but never overrated here at Alabama. But my thing is, my thing is this right here, and this is just going back to to uh, you know his performance from, uh, from, t- from Tuesday's minicamp with the Dolphins. People were jumping out of windows talking about, you know, Tua didn't throw well on Monday, two, two, well, on Tuesday. Tua was awful. Tua was, was terrible. You know, five interceptions at the, uh, at the, at the mini camp. Unacceptable, unacceptable. You can't have it. You can't have it. You can't have it. You know, Tua, Tua was bad. Tua was bad. Tua, Tua was awful. I'm going to just say this right now. I'm, I'm going to say this right now. I'm going to say this right now. It's June, people. We're talking about Dolphins minicamp where Tua is concerned, and it's June. It's June. If you're going to make mistakes, the mistakes need to happen now, not in July when you get to training camp, not during the season where the games actually matter. If you're going to have mistakes, mistakes need to happen now. And people are not understanding when you're going through 7-on-7, 11-on-11, you are throwing continuously. You are throwing consistently. Like, there were throws that Tua was making out there that he would not even attempt in a game. And when you have a brand-new offensive coaching staff, because Chan Gailey's no longer there, praise Jesus, you got a brand-new offensive coaching staff here, the key is they want Tua to be more aggressive, to drive the ball downfield, to take more shots, to put the ball out there, to be aggressive, to thread the needle. And when you're asking him to do this more, turnovers are going to happen. Now, of the five interceptions that were reported that he threw, two to three of those were not his fault. You know, they bounced off receivers' hands and got picked off. I call those circumstantial turnovers because it's not on the quarterback. Quarterback made the right read. Quarterback made the right throw. Quarterback made the right decision. It just received a card. It got hit. Bang. Ball pops up in the air. Picked off. It happens. That type of stuff happens. It was not all 
you know, on Tua right there. But I feel like, and this is what I feel like, Tua gets compared to four other young quarterbacks in the NFL. And uh, this is not our rationality talking here. This is our Postmates, Uber Eats, DoorDash, iPhone uh, technology, greedy culture speaking to us, the, the, the we want it now type ordeal, right? Because when we look at this, people are saying, well, two is not doing what uh, Josh Allen's doing. He's not doing what uh, Joe Burrow's doing. He's not doing what Baker Mayfield's doing. He's not doing what Justin Herbert's doing. Those other quarterbacks are in completely different situations. They came into completely different situations than what Tua came into. And here's my thing. Here's my thing. People forget Josh Allen's first year with the Bills was awful. He had more picks than touchdowns. But you, but people kept saying, be patient with that baby. Be patient with that young man. Be patient with him. Big Strong, athletic, he gonna be good, he gonna be good, be patient with him. So we can be patient with Josh Allen, and he ends up having an MVP caliber season uh, this past season. We, we can be patient with Joe Burrow. We can be patient with Justin Herbert. We can be patient with Baker Mayfield. But when it comes down to Tua, and Tua only played in, what, nine games last year? You know, six and three as a starter helped the team go 10 and six. But because he didn't pop the way y'all wanted him to pop, now you're ready to shove him outside the door like a prom night dumpster baby and go do away with him, pick somebody else. Give to a time, people. Give to a time. As, as he's back here in minicamp, this is his first time going through OTAs. He didn't have this last year because of COVID. This is his first time going through summer stuff. He didn't have this last year because of COVID. He was more so focused on, is my hip all right? Do I win the medical where my hip is concerned? Is my hip in fine working motion? That was the main concern that Tua had. Now that he's about to be two years removed from the hip, what we're seeing the, the things that he can do. Yes, he made some mistakes in, my, in Tuesday's mini camp. If mistakes are going to happen, better for them to happen now. But he bounced back today. Six touchdowns, no picks. And I'm hearing crickets. No one talking about the six touchdowns, no picks that Tua had today. So you're seeing that he is getting comfortable being aggressive throwing the football downfield. But Anyway, you want the best in news, notes, information, and coverage, people, when it comes to your Alabama football program. You can do this by accessing the Touchdown Alabama Magazine app. You download the app from the iPhone App Store if you're rocking Team Apple. Google Play Store if you got the Android phone. For your audio listening needs, we got you right here. iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn Radio, Google Play, Overcast.fm, or iHeartRadio. The good and gracious Lord C. Spirit, I'll be back on Friday. Continuing the conversation that is Tide Football. As always, Bama fans, you can purchase individual copies of Touchdown Alabama Magazine. Have those sent to your door. That link will be found in the description. Also, if you're trying to cop that new edition, that print edition of Touchdown Alabama Magazine, you go to touchdownalabama.com. You click join, become a member, a subscriber today. If you're also trying to get that four-finger bling necklace, four-finger bling jewelry, courtesy of our guys at weownthefourthquarter.com, uh, that link in the description as well. But until next time, folks, husbands, love your wives. Wives appreciate value. Those husbands, children, continue. As the summer progresses, doing the right thing, the good thing, the fun thing, the smart thing, the legitimate thing to not be bored. You get you those three hearty meals a day, those three great laughs a day. Protect yourself, protect the loved ones around you. Until next time, folks, it's been in my own words. 